um, just introduce Scott uh, Benningfield and um, go ahead, Scott. Take it Good away. morning. Thanks, Thank Roy. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, so I have here with, well, my name is Scott Beddingfield. I'm the Vice President of Construction and Development at, at Kohanike. And I've uh, got us with us here today, Nancy Burns, who has been a consulting uh, engineer with us through both our planning uh, and infrastructure uh, design process, uh, going back to what year, Nancy? 2003. Reggie Lee is our director of security and also a member of our cultural committee that advises us uh, on, on all the activities within the resort, resort or within the community and, uh, and is, whose family are lineal descendants uh, on the land. Uh, Stephen Rose is our natural resources manager. Uh, he has been responsible for the restoration uh, and cleaning of the Anculin ponds and, and also responsible for our uh, uh, managing all, all of the natural resources, including the bird population, which we've seen increase. And uh, he can maybe, if you're interested, he can tell you we've had um, uh, Audubon International here yesterday and today, uh, part of our certification process as an Audubon uh, International partner. So if you're interested, he can tell you more about that. Uh, Richard, Dr. Richard Brock is, was here somewhere. Oh, there he is. Uh, he, uh, he has been responsible for our monitoring of, of our ponds uh, that we partially treat through a reverse osmosis uh, plant uh, to, to use the water for irrigation. It's not fresh water, it's just less brackish, something we can manage. So we have him available uh, for questions, if you want more information about, about that system as well. He's actually parked over at the wastewater plant site. Dave's over there. Yeah, Dave's over there. Oh, that's right. And uh, David Barnes is also here from uh, Waimea Water Services. They're uh, part of our monitoring team uh, on uh, the monitoring wells uh, on site and the management of the uh, on the on site wells and, uh, and irrigation system. So he's here as well. And I think you brought, I asked him to bring some, uh, some well logs, if I remember. Oh, yeah, the chloride data? Yeah, from the from the monitoring wells. Yeah, which we didn't include in your packet. If you'd like to see that, uh, David's uh, brought that okay, down. Tell them there's room down here. Yeah, <laughs> we should tell them there's room down here. My department and I have worked on restoring um, this pond. Has had mosquito fish and guppies in it historically, um, so the restoration efforts were mainly focused on vegetative work. So um, if you came and looked at this pond like two or three years ago. There was a small stand of red mangrove in the center, and then it was everything outside of the red mangrove was pickleweed, Bacchus meritima, I think is the scientific name. Um, so over the years, we've chipped away, removing the mangrove, removing the pickleweed, and encouraging the native ground covers um, to come back. So what most of what you see here is native. We've got the Akuli Kuli, Ohelukai, Iaka, um, Makaloa out there. So just kind of, at this point, we just sort of maintain what we've done by doing a monthly or, or bi-monthly sweep to remove pickleweed and other invasives, and again, just let nature take its course. Um, we've seen in other ponds over time with the Akuli Kuli getting a foothold, it helps to kind of outcompete the pickleweed, which um, helps us out because it means less work for us. So, um, again, this is one of the more recently restored ponds, so it's still kind of coming around. Again, the main pond has has the mosquito fish and guppies in it, but you, there's small intermittent ponds, literally within like 20 feet, you know, 15 feet of this main basin, that are isolated from this pond, and, and you'll find opaiula in those ponds. So, another main concern when we're doing the restoration work is that we don't open up any channels between these two ponds, which is the reason why we're not really dealing with much of the sediment at this point. We don't want the the guppies to translocate to any ponds that have have the opai habitat. In there. As Stephen said, if you took all of the sediment out of the bottom of this pond and exposed the cracks in the lava where the water flows through, they can spread and they'll move between ponds that way. You know, if there's a, a crack, they'll allow them to get to another pond. Yeah. And in a lot of instances, in a lot of places, they have completely taken over complete systems of ponds that are, you know, in close proximity to one another. And these are all initially spread by people who say throw some mosquito fish in the pond. So, and mosquito fish aren't needed because in many ponds, the salinity is high enough, mosquitoes can't survive. Secondly, if the salinity is low enough, 
there's a related species to Opaula. It's uh, it, it has no common name as far as I know. It's Metabataeus mohina. It has it's a little predator and has pinchers like you know like like a lob main lobster would, and they actively feed on mosquito wing. Uh, so and they co-occur with the Opaula in the native system, but once it's been biologically degraded, there isn't a lot we can do unless we get the use of rotenone, which is a chemical, reversed. The and that's park? a federal... Yeah, are they National Park pursuing any special license or limited uh, use? Well, they license people to use it for agriculture yeah. and aquaculture. Aquaculture, fresh water. Uh, you cannot use it in saline waters of the United States. So this, is, this has some salinity, so it's saline. So it's illegal to use. And I know Division of Aquatic Resources in the past has had a lot of Pilakia with this, the same issue. And everybody's just had to back away. And then the other, you know, the other really awesome aspect about the job is, you know, archaeological things like this. This this whole wall was covered in pickleweed when we started the work, and we knew there was a portion of it on that on that north end. But you know, as we get through, we start removing the pickleweed and exposing things, we have uncovered uh, different archaeological features in, in the seven years that I've been here. That you know, even Reggie's mom didn't know about things that have come to light. So again, that's just another benefit of the job. And what um. According to what I have read, there's a book for those that are interested. Just a second, I have it right here. It's a nice little handbook. It's called Hawaiian Damselflies by Dan Polhemus and uh, Adam Asquith. And it has, the, it has the native damselflies in it. So anybody interested can read it. But what these gentlemen found is, is well, the damselfly as an adult is the thing you see flying around. It has a nymph that lives in brackish water. Okay, that's the larval stage. So the, the parents lay the eggs and the nymphs hatch. They feed, they grow, they emerge and turn into damselflies. Okay, they live, according to these guys, they can take salinities up to about eight parts per thousand. Um, and that's reasonably low. But we have ponds on the coast that are eight parts per thousand. And the other element of the of this species. This is an important species because it's an endemic and uh, I think it's on the list. It, yeah, it's on the list. Um, it is found not only in anculin systems, it is found in brackish water on all of the islands. Brackish and freshwater. As long as they don't have the predators present. So the anculin pond, hey, that's fine. I think we have them here in the uh, irrigation pond back inland, man-made irrigation pond. The salinity is nice and low and they do quite well, thank you. So you can build a pond. The pond that was built at uh, Koali Lodge on, on Lanai, after they built the pond, it was invaded by orange-back damselflies. Came from somewhere. But anyway, what I'm saying is, is that they're found in a variety of habitats in the Hawaiian Islands, lowland. They're not high elevation. Pearl Harbor, you said, is yeah, one, one of the has any habitat. place where you don't have a lot of fish. That's yeah. the downside. Yeah. See, something with fish like this, the larvae, the, the nymphs won't survive. And a lot of the ponds on this coast have the fish problem, the non-native fish. Have you seen a lot of the orange-back damselfly in the other systems that don't have the fish? Oh yeah, I've seen them. It, yeah, and they, they're used. Yeah, absolutely. What you're looking at is about a million and a half gallon a day capacity reverse osmosis plant. This uses brackish water, of course, which allows us to use a much lower pressure, also much lower energy consumption. The osmotic pressure of this water is about 70 psi, so these systems run at about 300 psi to pur purify the water. Seawater, by way of comparison, is about 300 psi. Osmotic pressure takes a thousand psi. So very important that we use the brackish water, as you see. The way the system works is because this doesn't have an equalization tank which you would normally fill from the wells, it's all direct pressure in. First thing it comes in through that big 10 inch pipe you see right over there. You see those blue cylinders? Those are pre-filters. They're basically big bags that it flows through. That takes out any sediment, any um, you know, particular anything floating out in the water. Comes up through the pipe system. Then it comes to the skids. There's a total of four arrays here. They're labeled A, B, C, and D. The way this, the skids actually work is the raw water comes in and then it feeds 
into the large booster pump, which is this right here. This is a 70 horsepower, 75 horsepower motor that's on what's called a variable frequency drive, the VFD. The VFD then controls the pressure, and what it looks for is the outflow of the membranes themselves, okay? So in other words, if there's not enough water coming out, it increases the pressure. We set limits on it to control the device. The pressure then comes into the pressure vessels, which are these right here, flows in through what's called a side port, these units comes in the side and then flows down the center of what's called a spiral wound membrane. Essentially it looks like a tube and has a spiral in it. Those have the actual membranes, the pressure pushes fresh water into the inside, works its way into the center and then comes out through the center port right here. This port you notice is just a sample port. This is how we check the water quality of what's actually going on. The other one that is plumbed, that's where the actual product water comes out. Then there you have two streams of water at this point. You have the fresh water and you have the concentrate. The fresh water then goes up through a series of pipes and goes out to the lake right over in that direction. There's a big pipe that goes down. The concentrate though actually heads out towards the injection well, but before it goes, it comes back and goes through these units right here. These are called power exchange units, all right? Pressure exchange unit, energy recovery, a whole bunch of different names for them. Those are actually a really neat piece. There's a single piece of machined aluminum oxide inside that spins. And what it does is it takes the high pressure concentrate and returns the energy back into the system. Saves about 80, 85% of the energy that would otherwise be dumped. By energy, you mean heat? No, energy is actually pressure. Because of course, water is not compressible. What it does is it takes the pressure on the concentrate. This is the saltier water puts it back into the system and then it returns it back into the membranes. And basically on one side, uh, this side, you have the pressure coming from the membranes. This side, you have the raw water that is then pressurized and pushed back into the membranes. The small motor you see in the back, just, the small motor you see in the back is a 10 horsepower motor on a VFD that makes up the small differential. So it all goes into the membranes under the same pressure. It's now, what reduces the load, but more importantly, is the high pressure that's coming out of the systems. What would happen is if you dump that away, you basically take the 300 PSI and dump it to zero, you're losing a lot of the energy, and the energy and the pressure is what actually makes the membrane function. You have to have about the 300 PSI. David Barnes, who is also a member of the company, he's a geologist and hydrologist. Both of us, for the record, have worked for the last five years with Steve Bowles on this, so for those of you who know him, um, a lot of this, of course, comes from him. This is the actual... Yeah, this is the actual spiral wound membrane itself. And if you look at the end, you can see that I can go into a lot of detail about these things. These are actually a very uh, high technology piece of equipment. They are, each unit is about 700 bucks. Um, they all last about four to five years and then you exchange them out. They do have to be clean, but we'll get into that a little bit later. Now, one of the major elements about this also is this particular area does not use fresh water for irrigation. It uses a mildly brackish water. This comes back to that line you see over there going straight up that has the arrow pointing up. That one is actually a brackish water line, or the raw water line that goes in and blends with the product from these. And what we can do then is we can actually adjust the salinity level in a lot of ways, and a lot of times we'll adjust it up or down based on what the golf course needs at a time, any given time. But the salt water, of course, goes on salt tolerant grasses, which allows us to use a little bit more water than otherwise would be processed. And of course it kills the weeds to prevent having to use any additional herbicides. Now that of the injection well is located off in that direction. There's not a whole lot to see, it's basically a hole. Um, but when you go in there, there's actually a vault in the bottom. And one of the major elements about a system like this, and anytime you use an injection well, is to make sure that you don't entrain any air. And what was done, it was dug down to sea level and then drilled below that. The whole system comes in under sea level, basically allows all the air to leave it, and then it goes down the injection well. In order to manage the actual aquifer, what was done is we pull off the very top, and you've seen some of the wells. Did anybody point wells out to you guys coming down here? Okay, those little brown things. Um, we pull off the very top of the brackish, which of course is the freshest water. Then what we do is we process it, we send it to the lake, and then the concentrate water, the well was actually drilled down until we match, found a matching salinity level. This water is only about uh, half as salty as seawater, so it's not salt water yet, and it's definitely not brine, it is concentrate. It's injected down to the back, that level, and of course, as the water moves through the whole area, it doesn't disrupt anything. Um, very important to everything that we do, and of course, David Barnes, who has been doing all the monitoring and all that, has all the data in his hands, uh, can show you that over the last six years of operation of this plant, we've had virtually no impact on the entire system. Those monitor wells were put in prior to the development of uh, the RO plant, and so we've been tracking salinity data before development, into development, and all the way through. Every month I get to go around and uh, crawl through the bushes and go across the golf course and dodge balls and collect samples and report to the sea worm. Um, I wanted to give you, a, I didn't get a chance over at the RO, but I wanted to give you a, a, 
just a sense of what it is like to monitor these wells as far as the quality. I don't have enough um, handouts for everyone. If you want a copy, please let me know later. I'll get it to you. Um, but basically, this is the total of data that I've been collecting on it. Black line is the pumpage of the plant. They go up and down, as you would expect. Right here is the beginning prior to the plant starting up, before the golf course grew in. Okay, So once the plant started up and we started pumping all those production wells, as you might expect, the chlorides in the wells, on the monitor wells, did rise. Okay, We were tracking it, and then we had the grow in of, of the grass, okay? Because we were you know, trying to get the grass growing for the golf course. And slowly, the chlorides in the monitor wells started to go back down, okay? That's most likely due to the irrigation water directly on the ground going back into the aquifer. And I'm picking it up in the monitor wells. We do have, you know, variation all the time. Um, Later I tracked that it's actually mostly to do with the tide, the ups and downs. So the black line in this is the tide from the Kauai High Harbor gauge. Sorry, and these are the levels in the... 2008 to yeah. well, two, this is This is, I, I just sort of uh, focused in on a smaller period so you can see a little bit better the curves, but this is say 2010, about one year ago. All right, so the well that we're going to go to in a few minutes is monitor well 400. I've seen that one change the most and, and recently. Uh, it's the green right here. Starts out in line with all the others. And then right around in this time in 2011, it starts to go down and drastically. What starts the Sorry, the level of the chloride is in the water. Okay, so it's freshening. And it went back up a little bit, but then it's sort of stabilized way below everything else. Okay, keep that in mind when we walk over to the well, and maybe we'll have a quiz and see <laughs> <laughs> what you think is causing this decline in salinity. I'm comparing the um, the marine life monitoring program and incline pond monitoring program and the uh, water quality monitoring program. And wasn't there a management plan? There's also the Audubon natural, um, resource, natural resource management plan. plan. So we had a whole bunch of monitoring already on the project and when we decided to do the RO, Planning Department, Commission on Water Resources and National Park all came together again to reinforce that monitoring and add monitoring wells. And that's how we got the three monitoring wells along the park boundary because we wanted to make sure that we were not going to impact the park with any of the operations here. So we already had um, on the property the 200 series, which are in the beginning when you come into the property, and the 300 series, which are closer to the ocean. So the idea is to sample what comes into the property from upslope because, of course, you know, that's a factor too. Water moves through the ground from upslope. So just because we find something in the water doesn't mean it came from the property. So that's why we have monitoring walls intercepting flows that come on, like goes, goes through the project, and um, we monitor what goes towards the National Park and also what's towards the sea. And we also have um, quite a few ponds that we're sampling for constituents also. And I think that was the, the park had made some, some recommendations on the drainage on the, system? Well, on the depth of the well, too. Um, the, these wells were all originally proposed to be shallow, 30 feet or so, and then we did one well, which is not the one we're going to, but the one upstream from that that is at the same elevation that we're injecting. So um, to trace the injectate if it goes, crosses the line or has any issues with the salinity. So we kind of think we have our bases covered as far as monitoring what's what's and, happening on this property. And just quickly, I think we touched it on this material we handed out on the drainage system. Um, all of the golf holes are designed as retention ponds. Uh, and the, the Mackay golf holes are along the shoreline, we actually have uh, pumping stations. So if, if in the event of a major storm event to prevent water from going into the 
into the shore area, near shore area, we can pump the water inlet to, to other golf holes that are service retention basins. You may have noticed all of our, our roadways are, are, uh, have shoulders of grass. Those are, are the, the swales that collect the runoff from the streets and from the lots potentially. They service bioswales, and if I remember correctly, that was a part of the conversation with the National Park Service. Right. Uh, to So that before the water goes into the uh, into our drainage structures and back into the aquifer, uh, where sediments and other potential contaminants are filtered out. Uh, and on the golf course, uh, because we do use some, uh, some fertilizers and uh, herbicides or not, pesticides, uh, we have charcoal filters in the drainage structures on the golf course. So, and again, that, you know, that was part of, I, I think some of what you have to say was, was uh, maybe brought to uh, um, our attention as a, as a best practice uh, by Park Service. Well, the, I, I wasn't here then, but The National Park Nancy Service was. had approval authority on our drainage plan. So we had it um, devise a drainage system that kind of met their stringent requirements for stormwater, um, cleaning up the stormwater and, and filtering it. So, so yeah, the part of the SMA conditions gave National Park Service authority over the drainage system on this property, the, uh, approval authority.